So thanks to everybody who came on board for participating. It makes it more interesting to have people be interested in, and this whole, you know, four part series has made my month more interesting, really, uh, to have things to think about other than taking care of my carrot patch. <laughs> Uh, I, I have notes that I don't use very much, but uh, a few things I wanted to remember. So I have, uh, to reiterate, uh, at the Met Naturalist website, the second item on the left, it says stratigraphy of the Met Hattel. And there's a little more now. So that was the first week, that stratigraphy chart. And now there are those uh, oh, evolutionary charts of plants and animals, which I think are interesting because they show how many types how many different of the different types of plants, how many there are in the world and how many there are in the Methow, like uh, 300,000 flowering plants in the world and how many in the Methow, 1,200, that kind of thing. It's just interesting to know. And then the same for animals, how many uh, mammals in the world, which I don't remember, and how many in the Methow, which I think is 72 actually. So those are posted all in the same, it's a PDF. And there's one more thing I, so I'm gonna post, I. I I would have put it up if I could have found it, but in this in this program, uh, a short reference to a volcanic island in Indonesia called Krakatoa comes up, and actually it's actually called Anak Krakatoa, which is a child of Krakatoa because Krakatoa blew up in I think it was 1883, and then soon after a new volcanic island began to appear, and they called it Anak Krakatoa. And I wrote a story about that because we're talking about ecology and that island is now, it was just volcanic. There was no life on it. That would be the point in 18, 84, 85, 1885 when it appeared. Now it's covered with a tropical rainforest. And so it's an interesting example of how ecosystems build their cells. And so I, I'm going to put that story. It's like three written pages with some pictures. It'll still say stratigraphy of the Met Owl. You have to click on it and you'll get the PDF. There's that. I want to put in a plug for the subject called big history, which we talk about. I, I've used the term once or twice. It's, it's really the evolutionary story, mostly of the planet. And as we talked about in geology, it's not just life on the planet. The rocks have evolved over time. It's shocking. And we didn't talk very much about that. I mentioned it, and I'm just going to mention briefly that there's a lot more continental rock and more continents than there used to be. Continental rock is silica. We mentioned that. Silica has a lower melting point than iron, magnesium. So if you heat, if you heat rock to 1,000 degrees, the silica will melt and the iron won't. And, and rocks have evolved over time. The silica came out of this more complex rock and formed continental rock. So that's big history, that, that it's a journey. The universe is on a journey. Life on the planet is on a journey. If, so there is the website called The Big History Project, and that's what I'm plugging at the moment, and it was my daughter who reminded me. It's a subject I'm interested in, but they have a whole course. If you go just Google Big History Project, and you can find this course, it's set up in, in part one, part two, part three, part four, part five, videos, conversations. I found it fascinating. I just wanted to bring that up. And so, as I said last time, the next, if you don't subscribe to The Naturalist, you might want to consider it. The current issue that came out a couple of days ago is on the geology of the Met How. It's what we talked about in the first program. And I think in the next one, which is issue number 100, 25 years worth, we'll do an article on the Goldilocks effects, which the science uses this term, Goldilocks effects, and that's, remember Goldilocks, she liked everything just right, Goldilocks liked everything just right, porridge, chair, bed. There is a strange, mysterious element to this planet, and that is that so many things are just right for life. It's very mysterious. I mean, uh, there's the physicist at Stanford, I forget his name, he says there's an elephant in the living room. We're ignoring the fact. We don't know. We do not know. We leave it to mystery, but it's, it gives you goosebumps to entertain the subject of the Goldilocks effects on planet Earth. Okay, that's it. 
So this is Mountain Lady Slipper. And it, this was a little more challenging to put this program together because ecology is partially, it's largely invisible. It's about relationships and we don't see the relationships. We see the flower. We know nothing about why it is shaped the way it is. But every living thing on the planet has been shaped by relationships with other living things and with the physical environment. And that's ecology and it's a great subject. And I even told myself, you need, when you go out the door, I want you to stop thinking about yourself <laughs> and think about relationships. Look around, I'm talking to myself. What are the relationships of these plants and animals that are out here? You're missing it because it's just a little more subtle. So this flower evolved in deep relationship with other aspects of uh, its environment. And that's why I chose it, other than the fact that it's such an interesting picture. I think that picture is by Rosalie de la Flor, if those of you who know Rosalie as and I grabbed it. But this is that this is that bunch of, of mountain lady slippers on the Dripping Springs Trail. Some of you might know it. It blooms every year, like a hundred flowers in this big clump right on the trail in probably mid-June, I would say. Very worth seeing. Uh, why? Well, what are its relationships? For one, it needs moist soil. You're not going to find this out in the shrub step. It likes a little shade. It grows. So it, it has a particular environment that it grows in. All orchids are in relationship with fungi. Mycorrhizal fungi, the word mycorrhizal means root fungus. And all orchids are in a relationship with the fungi in this, a particular fungi in the soil. You, that's why you can't dig an orchid up and put it in a pot and it'll grow. It won't, it needs this relationship. So there are these hidden relationships, but I would say more mysterious, what is going on with the shape of that flower? And flowers, if they're showy, have evolved to attract a pollinator, usually insects, sometimes other animals, to pollinate it. Well, this is a trap pollinator, and that white bulb is a trap. You can see there's an entry point at the top. So it goes in there and can't get out. Literally cannot get out. The side, inside slides, the sides are a little bit slimy. Can't fly out, can't climb out. The only way out is through a... A hole in the back of the flower. It's unbelievable that this kind of thing could evolve. So the insect, a small bee, it's, it's pollinated by small bees. Small bee goes in, finds itself trapped, is attracted by um, a fragrance to move towards the back of the flower. There are there are hairs pointing towards the back of the flower, which actually are in that drying at the bottom of the flower. So once the insect starts in this channel, it can't back out because the hairs point the other way. And it for has to, to get out, it can see light, it forces it th th right through this little channel. And as it forces its way out, the flower glues a glob of pollen to its head. And I put in a picture, that little bee that's flying away, I put that pollen on its head just to give you the idea. I could have, I actually have pictures of the pollen, but I didn't put them in. So this is a co-evolutionary relationship with the animal world, an intense, deeply evolved, and it's, um, it's an uneven relationship. I don't actually know anything that the insect gets out of this. That's why they call it a trap pollinator. It's fooling, it's fooling the insect. And that's not uncommon in the world of survival. And I think it says something about why our lives are challenging. That is, I'm speaking now in the broadest sense of Homo sapiens because this is the context in which Homo sapiens have evolved in a, in a world of survival. It's not a given that any living thing will survive for very long on the planet. What are animals thinking about? Each survive, reproduce. Really, that really does cover most of it, except for Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens seem, you know, we have an enlarged brain and one, we do, we ask questions and we do wonder what it's all about. And my thesis, my hypothesis is it's about something. Refreshingly, I don't know what, because it's very, it's very uh, dangerous to make up a story about what it's about. But the fact that there is something going on is exciting.
and that we're a part of it. And that is the big history story, which I recommend. It's also the story of ecology, is, which was what we're talking about. So we, we're talking about eat, survive, reproduce. So there's something else going on, and that is profound cooperation. And this is my effort to illustrate that. This is a phenomenon that evolved about a long time ago. It evolved a long time ago. I mean, like probably a billion years ago. It's called endosymbiosis. It was to some degree developed by Lynn Margulis, whose name I've mentioned before, famous for being the ex-wife of Carl Sagan. <laughs> but very famous in her own right. You know, bacterial cells envelop and eat other organisms. That's how they eat. Uh, often it's in this way, they just surround it and then they absorb the nutrients in the other organism in the process of killing it. What appears to have happened sometime in evolutionary history is one cell enveloped another one and it, it could not digest it and they started to work together. And we ended up with our style of cell, which is called a eukaryotic cell, that is just full of little organelles inside of the cell that almost have lives of their own. And it seems to be from this process of endosymbiosis, which means symbiosis means working together, endo means inside. The best example are mitochondria, which um, ex mitochondria, <laughs> they, they, they're involved in the energy production in the cell, which actually means taking the, the food apart, because that's where we get our energy inside the cell and extracting the energy from it, mitochondria. They have their own DNA. They're independent little organisms inside of all of our cells, except for red blood cells. They just don't need mitochondria. But all these little dots in this picture are organelles. Many of them seem to have evolved from this process called endosymbiosis. It's cooperation. So we have eat, survive, reproduce, and we have profound cooperation on the planet. And I thought one of the best examples of this is a blue whale. Because a blue whale, it's the largest animal to ever exist on the planet. It has 50 trillion. It's made up of 50 trillion cells. I don't know who counted them. They all work, they together. All work together. They all work together to make a blue well. It's, it's deep, profound level of cellular cooperation that we don't think about. It's ecology, relationship. Ecology means, uh, it literally means um, study of the household. That's what, if you break it down to the Latin eco ecology, study of the household, but they're talking about the relationships. Ecology is a study of the relationships of living things with one another and with the earth, the habitat that they live in. So what's it all about? Well, it's definitely about competition. This is a lion killing a zebra. Uh, it happens all the time. Everything eats everything else. It's so shocking. If you go to the Methow NASA's website, I posted that article, that myth that Joseph Campbell brought forward from Hindu myth, and this is what it's about. Life, eat, live, life eats by living itself. It does. It does, and it's just very difficult for human sensibilities, but there's no way around it. But it's also about cooperation. Homo sapiens evolved in a atmosphere of co cooperation between individual organisms and obviously that's not uncommon. And it's about beauty. This is a picture of the Meha River. Where's all this beauty come from? It's not, you know, it's, beauty is not necessary for eating, surviving, or reproducing. But the whole planet is magnificent. So it's not just about eat, survive, or reproduce. I wanted to bring up uh, this strange phenomenon, the Big Bang. Everything sprang from nothing in a single instant. Uh, I had to, what do they call it? They call it a singularity. Remember that term, singularity? The universe was a singularity. It was, ever, all matter and energy was compact, compacted into a particle smaller than an atom. And then it exploded and has been expanding ever since and it created the universe. Well, there's a famous biologist named Terence McKenna. He, he's dead as of year 2000. Uh, but he said, if you believe that, I have a bridge over the Hudson River that I'll sell you for $5. <laughs> he said, he said uh, science 
Science says all we ask for is one miracle. And look at the way we dismiss it. The whole universe was compacted into a particle smaller than an atom. We just use words to dismiss the magic of the universe. So I guess you can't see this very well because my picture is so small. I don't even know if you can see me at all, but I, if you can see that picture of me, I have this magic wand that I got for river camp. I had to go give it up. But we're talking about magic. We're talking about miracles, and we just dismiss it with words. There is no way to understand. And, and the evidence is that, that there, it, this comes from scientific evidence that the universe is definitely expanding. Everything, everything is moving away from everything else. You know, what they say is in the first milliseconds, gravity appeared and electromagnetic energy. Excuse me, what is gravity? <laughs> Nobody knows what gravity is. Everything in the universe attracts everything else. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. So we just dismiss these miracles with words, and we shouldn't do that. Life appeared. This is a cartoon. Uh, science has tried to recreate life in a beaker. And you've heard about this. You may not remember, but it's a famous experiment in 1953. They flashed electricity into these amino acids. Into, they weren't amino acids, but... But they ended up with amino acids, which are building, which are the building blocks of life. And they felt that they were getting so close to the creation of life. Well, that's as close as they ever got. <laughs> it was in 1953. Anyhow, in the cartoon, you know, he, she creates it and says, are you my mommy? The fact of the matter is life evolved from the planet and the planet is made out of rocks. So if somebody could kindly explain to me how you could get life to evolve out of rocks. So. another miracle so a few of you have seen this before I was just so astonished when I realized what was going on on the atomic level and this is not difficult to understand what what I'm going to talk about why this stuff exists I don't have a clue that picture is a hydrogen atom hydrogen atoms have one proton and one electron. They often don't have a neutron. I don't know why, but they often don't. So the electron is in what they call a shell. You remember that, or an orbital. And that there's, there, the, there's a first shell and a second shell and a third shell. Well, the first shell only holds two electrons. Now, who made that rule? I don't know, but it's true. The first shell holds two electrons. Well, hydrogen only has one electron. So hydrogen has a sort of some sort of electromagnetic desire for a second electron. And what we're saying here is that the construction of larger uh, atoms of, um, I'm not remembering what we're building here, molecules. The construction of larger molecules is built into the very basis of the universe because hydrogen only has one electron and it wants two and that it doesn't end there oxygen has uh, eight electrons well the first shell has the two because you only get two electrons in the first shell the second shell has six electrons but the second shell holds eight i mentioned previously that oxygen is one of the most Electrical, electrochemically active of the elements. It wants to attach itself to other elements. So look at what are we gonna get here? We have hydrogen wanting one more electron and oxygen wanting two more electrons. Let's give H2O a try. How about that? There's H2O, water. Water is an inevitable natural outcome of the very basic structure of the universe. It has to happen. And so, you don't stop with water, and I wanted to share, and I do need to look at my notes for this. Hopefully I can find it. So I actually don't, I forget who said this particular line. There's no shortage of ordered self-assembly in the universe. Snowflakes, from snowflakes to the rings of Saturn. So powerful is this natural impulse to assemble. Many scientists now believe that life may be inevitable 
or in the words of the Belgian biochemist, Christian de, de Dove, who won a Nobel Prize in medicine, life may be an obligatory manifestation of matter. Because of this very process that we're talking about, it doesn't stop with water. These elements want to combine with other elements. They want to be in relationship. It's built into the universe. Ecology, the interaction of organisms with one another and with matter. So things that we need to think about living on planet Earth. Energy. The, the ecosystem lives on energy that comes from the sun. The sun comes up in the morning and it goes down in the evening. <laughs> so it flows. It flows in. It flows in, I think, the next pictures here, the sun. It's 93 million miles away. I mean, I could invoke my magic wand. It seems magical to me that a star 93 million miles away is powering all life on the planet in this way. Water flows from the sky on an annual basis, a lot in the spring, less in the fall, not much, I mean, where we are, but it flows through ecosystems. It doesn't sit in an ecosystem. Energy flows through ecosystems, it doesn't stay. It's captured by living things, it stays as long as the living things can retain it, and then it's released usually as heat. It, it flows in from the sun as light energy, which is a powerful form, is released by heat, which is considered a weak form of energy. Resources. How many resources are flowing in from space? <laughs> None. They were all delivered 4.5 billion years ago. If the biosphere had not been cycling every resource necessary for life for the past 4 billion years, life would have ground to a halt, but it does. It recycles everything. Soil's a basis of life, terrestrial life, and stable ecosystems have stable populations. You know, not completely stable, but generally stable. So to reiterate a little of this, energy flows from outside the ecosystem. It comes from the sun, 93 million miles away, flows through the ecosystem and leaves. But it's captured by living things. How is it captured? I love this artistic, I think I Googled uh, photosynthesis art or something like that. <laughs> Everything's, you can find everything. That's a great little image of how the sun is powering the living ecosystem on the planet because the energy is flowing in, runs this water wheel, the energy is captured by plants. So here's the, we know this process, carbon dioxide plus water goes to sugar and oxygen. I put in an arrow because the energy of the sun is captured in that carbon-hydrogen bond, C6H12. I'm not sure what the oxygen's doing. It's sugar, C6H12O6 is sugar, and I'm sure the oxygen's necessary. But the energy is in the way that the hydrogen electrons are related to the carbon. And to get that, so that's the energy of the sun, it's been stored by photosynthesis in sugar, which is inside the plant, and then the plant can turn that into whatever it wants. Starch, lignin, cellulose, it all starts with sugar. If you can pull that hydrogen away from the carbon, you release the energy of the sun. And that's what we do when we digest food. When we eat a plant, it's the oxygen. That's why we breathe oxygen, because we need that electro, the power of oxygen to reclaim that hydrogen. And it releases energy in the process because let. It's hard to explain why, and I don't fully understand it. It has to do with the position of the electron. The electron, in oxygen, the electrons pull closer to the nucleus and it gives off energy. That's quantum mechanics and we don't need to get that. Roger Lake, before it burned up, doesn't look quite like this now, but I just love this picture because of all the biomass. Look at all those conifer trees. Where did all that biomass come from? We have dealt with this question. I mean, if you tried to weigh that, you know, it's hard to do these prescribed burn, this, this forest management and prescribed burns. These trees, you cut down one tree and you've got a day's work in front of you. They're heavy. Every tree is so heavy. Where does all that biomass come from? It comes from the atmosphere. Oh, I gotta. How's that possible? You know, they say, I think, what do we have here? This is the weight of the six kingdoms and the GT of carbon, that is the weight of plants and it's gigatons, it's billions of tons. 
So those numbers are how many billions of tons of the six kingdoms. Animals, two, there's two gigatons of animals on the planet, just roughly. Plants, 400, it's all plants. The biosphere is all plants. Everything else is like a hangnail <laughs> on the plants. Because the plants are the only ones that can create food out of the gases in the atmosphere. It's a magic show. <laughs> so then the question comes up, where does nature put its garbage? For those of you who subscribe to The Naturalist, there's an article by that title in the current issue. So nature has made all this uh, organic matter. Where's it gonna, uh, for four billion years, by the way, what, or how's it gonna get rid of it? It's just gonna pile up and make a mess. This is a uh, forest at Cutthroat Lake. And I took this picture because I got interested in the process actually of creating soil. And I thought I need some pictures of creating soil. And if you walk by these rock slides, you know, on our, any of our mountain trails, you know how it goes. You walk through a forest, you get up to the edge of the forest, like the, like the Maple Pass Loop, and then you come out of the forest and you're on a rock slide. Well, just before that, the forest is also a rock slide, but the forest is covering over the rock slide with soil. This is, these are fungi decomposing this dead cottonwood tree. And so there are kingdoms and organisms that will, with some difficulty, break down the organic structure of plants. And this is also up there, Cutthroat Lake, but this is decomposition of organic matter creating soil. So this was a boulder field and it's turning into a garden. And it was the plants who created the soil by incorporating the organic matter, which we call humus, into that soil. And this is one of the profound processes of ecology. I spend tremendous amount of energies, energy taking care of my compost pile, <laughs> trying to create humus for the garden. Soil. Well, this was interesting to me. Uh, ideal soil is 45% mineral, but 25% air, 25% water, and 5% organic. It's, if it doesn't have organic matter, it's not going to hold any water, and you're not going to be able to grow very much in it, just certain weedy plants that have adapted to poor soil. What fascinates me after gardening for 20 years is the organic matter is temporary. You're never done putting organic matter in the soil because it decomposes and it disappears. It needs more, it needs more organic matter every year. So it's a full, it's a full time job. And so why the organic matter? Well, for two reasons. One is that it holds water and you can't have life without water. The other is it has the energy of the sun in those hydrogen carbon bonds from photosynthesis. And when those break down, they feed the, uh, the, uh, soil ecosystem and this is a breakdown i forget the size there i'll bet that's a square foot i forget it's not very big and what they've done they're showing how many organisms are in a given measure it's either a foot or a meter that is 10 trillion bacteria at the bottom in a square foot of soil protozoa 10 oh that was that's a million billion trillion what comes after trillion is that like zillion bacteria Five million nematodes, mites, springtails, where are they getting their food? From the, de from the energy being released by, these are, a lot of these are decomposers. They're decomposing that organic matter. This is the passage of energy through an ecosystem. So we're getting a million joules. The J is abbreviation for joule. J-O-U-L-E-S, it's a measure of energy, a very tiny measure of energy. I've never gotten quite used to it, but that's what it is. For, so for every million joules of sunlight that reaches the earth, plants capture 1% of that, 10,000 joules. When an animal eats a plant, only 10% of the energy gets passed on. So we have a grasshopper, primary consumer, eating a plant. It only gets 10% of the energy. The West is released as heat. When a carnivore eats the herbivore, the 10% rule. So that's why at the top of the food chain, uh, large 
fierce animals are rare. There's a book by that title. Why are large fierce animals rare? This is why. Because the energy is dissipating as it passes through the ecosystem. It's just, it's a rule. Oh, it's called entropy. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's how ecosystems are built, but all of the resources that are not arriving from space have to be cycled. And we know this water cycle, this is fairly mundane, but I circled vegetation because in tropical ecosystems, 50% of the rain that falls comes from the vegetation itself. So you might get 100 inches of rain in a tropical forest in a year. It's coming from the vegetation. The vegetation, the water's transpiring through the trees back into the atmosphere and falls back on the ground. And unfortunately, you know, our species, which is confused for good reason about ecological principles, we were not born with an ecology handbook. We have to learn this. We are learning it. It would be nice if we could speed it up. But this is a picture I took. I went to Afghanistan in. 2010, <clears throat> 2010, took this picture from the plane. No vegetation. Afghanistan used to be 50% forested. Afghanistan is now 1% forested. They cut the cut trees have all been cut down. And this is true in many of the arid areas of the world. We've made those arid areas by cutting down the trees because we were not born with an ecology handbook. The fact that we have started to learn this is magnificent really uh we're a magnificent species we just need to somehow get over the inertial hump and understand that we live in an ecological context and love it it's just beautiful all the nutrients are cycled so carbon plants have to have carbon there's no more being delivered phosphorus nitrogen all these things are cycled all the time the no more are coming from space um, Tim Flannery, who wrote that book, The Eternal Frontier, and The Weather Eaters, has this line. He said, if you want to know how healthy your ecosystem is, tell me when your last ice age was. What's he mean by that? These ice ages ground up the mountains. They ground them up into dust, and they release phosphorus and potassium from the rocks. And so any place that has had a recent ice age has, has uh, excellent soil. Australia, which is where Tim Flannery is from, he's an Australian. I don't, they haven't had an ice age for, I don't know, could be a hundred million years. Their soil's terrible. You know, one of the reasons the Great Barrier Reef is having so much trouble is they use so many fertilizers in their terrible soil and it runs off the rivers and into the sea and kills those organisms, uh, creates too many nutrients. Uh, the point being, these elements necessary for life all cycle. So nitrogen, plants have to have nitrogen. You know, it's not a part of the structure of the plant, but it's a part of the DNA. Nitrogen is necessary for DNA and for the amino acids that make up the building blocks of some of the, some parts of the plant has to have nitrogen. All the nitrogen on the planet is locked up in the atmosphere. The, nit the atmosphere is 78% nitrogen. It's almost all nitrogen, but it's N2. There is, oh, Chuck. I have to repeat all this. Uh, it's locked together. Two, two molecules, they must be sharing those electrons to complete that shell. I'm sure they are. They're locked together and they're not available to life. The only organisms that know how to break nitrogen apart are bacteria. And a lot of those bacteria are anaerobic, which means they cannot live in the presence of oxygen because oxygen is so powerful. So they live in hidden away places like on the root nodule of plants. So that's a legume and I withheld that one for a moment because I think it's surprising that alder is, uh, I forget the term, but it has these uh, nodules for uh, nitrogen to host, host nitrogen bacteria that then somehow capture the nitrogen in the atmosphere and break it apart from N2 and turn it into ammonia, which is then available for plants. It's a relationship. Everything is in a relationship. Populations are stable over time, not completely. I mean, all species, all species go extinct, which isn't that stable, but over shorter periods of time, which we can say 100,000 years, million years, 
Populations are stable. This is the story of lynx and snowshoe hare that you've heard about in the past. Snowshoe hare populations go up, lynx populations go up. Hare population drops, lynx population drops. But it repeats itself over time. And if you graph that with a line, the line would go right down through the middle because over time the population is stable. This is another ecological principle because all these organisms are in relationships with other organisms. You can't have one organism dominating the relationship. So we had the spotted frog last week. They lay 500 eggs and that's multiple egg masses, multiple, probably 30 or 40 frogs. But each frog lays 500 eggs. How many have to survive to replace the parents? Two. What's going to happen to the rest? They're going to get eaten. <laughs> It's a rough world. This is St. Matthew's Island off the coast of Alaska, and it's an interesting example of life out of balance. So there was a radio transmitter on this island during World War II, and in 1943, they decided to stock the island with reindeer. They put 22 reindeer on the island so that the few men on this radio transmitter would have access to fresh meat. The war ended two years later, the men left and the reindeer stayed. And there were no predators on the island. It was an unnatural situation. The reindeer couldn't get to this island. It was too far offshore. The lichen, the lichen was covered with, the island was covered with lichen. So what happened is their population exploded. This is a graph of their population that starts, on, that graph starts bottom left, 1944, 29 reindeer. The number 29 is written in there went up to 1,000 in 1958, went up to 6,000 in 1965. They ate every plant on the island and the population cr crashed. And today there are no reindeer on St. Matthew's Island. They starved to death. And it's a tremendous example of uh, ecology out of balance, of uh, disturbance of natural Ecosystem, ecosystem rhythms, uh, introducing an herbivore with no carnivores. <laughs> and it both destroyed the ecosystem on the island and then the reindeer starved to death. So it's, you know, it's a good warning to any living organisms that have the capacity to think about ecological <laughs> principles of which there's only one on the planet and that's us. Characteristics of Terrestrial ecosystems, this is a repeat. There's a slight change down below. Energy flows, water flows through, resources cycle. There are no more being delivered. For rich ecosystems, you have to take care of the soil. You cannot mine the soil. It has to have organic matter annually reintroduced. Of course, nature does that. Leaves fall off, plants fall over and die and the population should be stable over time. So a durable human culture, we would live primarily on energy income. Where's, it, where's that energy coming from? The sun. What do we actually live on? We live on ancient sunlight. There's a book called The Last Days of Ancient Sunlight. It's a great title. What's, what's he referring to? He's referring to fossil fuels, oil and natural gas and, car, and coal are all uh, fossilized plant matter that have that carbon-hydrogen bond, we call them hydrocarbons, in their structure and were buried in, in and are available to a species clever enough to be able to access that energy buried underground. And that is what human culture, we know we're almost 8 billion people, is living on. We're living on fossil sunlight and it's extremely limited. Uh, I mean, it would almost certainly will come to an end in this century. Uh, it's getting harder to access it. It's just not an ecologically durable way to live. Living on energy income, what does that mean? That is a complicated question. <laughs> it means living simpler lives, actually. Simpler lives. Mm. Probably a little more humility, actually, and a little more ecological. Water, I couldn't figure out, you know, how do you talk about water? And this word expropriation, we are, you know, the water was all, like in the Met House, all the water was already being used. It's not like it was going to waste. And now we have these, you know, we all use it for our houses, but we have these uh, 
fancy sprinkler systems that are, that water is coming out of the river. It's not directly out of the river, it's out of the water table. But that water was necessary for other living things, so we are expropriating it. So how about being frugal? I like that word. Create no waste, imagine that. So 10 million species on the planet, how much waste? None, how is that possible? And we don't know how to live that way, but it would be possible for us to do that. And of course, in early, I mean, for the, the long term of human history, there was no waste. You know, they, they peg human evolutionary story 200,000 years. So the waste is probably only 150 years. And it doesn't mean, I mean, I don't talk about it enough in this, but the big history story is that we're on an evolutionary journey and it's an emergent, it's a story of emergence. New things are constantly emerging. There was nothing, there was no planet. There was no life on this planet. Now look, it's all emerged over time. There is no reason that ecological intelligence cannot continue to emerge. Number four, build soil. Five, stable population. I mean the population, the population of the planet is growing by 82 million human beings a year. That's not sustainable. It's, and, and we're living on fossil fuels. I mean, this is, this is common knowledge in environmental, and it's nobody's fault that many people do not understand this, but from an ecological perspective, it's just basic reality. We were not born with an ecological handbook, but we are slowly waking up to ecological reality. So I mentioned <laughs> Anna Krakatoa. <clears throat> so Krakatoa blew up, and I think in the upper picture there, <clears throat> I think there was nothing there after the island blew up and it started to reappear a few, few years later and scientists realized it was a great study of how do ecosystems appear? How do they build themselves? And so they sent uh, research groups to the island uh, and the island now is a tropical rainforest, although there have been some big uh, eruptions again, I think in the last year and the lava just flows down over the tropical rainforest and burns it up. You know? <laughs> That's the way it is. Life is dangerous on planet Earth. But it has, that ecosystem has rebuilt itself. And I will put the article when I can find it. I mean, today sometime, it'll be with that <clears throat> item at the Meta Naturalist website because it's interesting to think how do ecosystems build themselves. And to me, it's interesting that the Methow had to do the same thing. That this is a picture of the Methow, 15,000 years ago, it was a river of ice. There was a mile of ice everywhere. All of us who are here right now, we were buried under a mile of ice. There was no life here except maybe on the mountain peaks. Mount Gardner was a noon attack and Silver Star was, a, just the peak was sticking out. Couldn't be much up there. It would not be very amenable to life. But now look, it's full of life. How do ecosystems build their cells? It's a wonderful question and fun to entertain. And here is the Mahal today. And so that is uh, the story. Planet Earth is, uh, it's unique in the solar system. It may very well be unique in the universe. Life hangs by a thread. And that would be the Goldilocks story that there are hundreds of aspects of life on earth that seem utterly coincidental and without any one of them, say the ozone layer. Oxygen was released by photosynthesis, which didn't exist. And then photosynthesis was invented by plants and, and bacteria released the oxygen in the atmosphere formed ozone, which is O3, three atoms of oxygen, and it blocks UV light. If there was no ozone, we couldn't live on land. The ozone, that cosmic energy is too powerful and it breaks up living cells. Life hangs by a thread. So it's like, have a nice day. <laughs> Lucky to be here. Planet from the moon, great picture. Such a nice planet. Good planets are hard to find. We have one, and they're not very big. This is a pale blue dot. Many of you might remember the pale blue dot. Uh, if you Google pale, uh, pale blue dot Carl Sagan, you'll get his six minute rant on living on this pale blue dot. So there is a pale blue dot in this picture and it's the earth. It's a picture of the earth from space and it's hard enough to see that I put an arrow in. That is the earth from space. And as, as Carl Sagan says, all of uh, of anything we can think of, all of the 
people we know and all of our history and all of our